So let's talk through the Space Marine Codex and how I'd go about fielding every single unit in the book. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel where we're all about getting the most out of your miniatures on the tabletop. Today I thought we'd take another look through Codex Space Marines and do something a bit different, talk through each and every unit in the entire Codex and roughly how I'd think about fielding them if I had to field a unit like that in game. As I'm sure most Space Marine players are fully aware these days, there's a lot of units that are kind of suboptimal, maybe eclipsed by some of the other myriad of options within the book. Though I still think it's kind of interesting to try and get the best out of less top tier units. Of course a lot of people just have units they enjoy using or happen to own and want to put them on the tabletop anyway. With that in mind we're going to go through each section of the codex, talk about how I think about fielding the unit both in terms of the squad size, number of squads and war gear, any particular support I'd really want for the model or squad, whether or not it's characters or stratagems or something, and then just a very rough game plan of what I'd usually tend to be using the unit for. Obviously there's a bit of an overview, there's a lot more nuance that you could go into depth with for every single codex in the game. I will try and cover a couple of codex synergies as we go through, though I'm largely going to be sticking within the confines of the standard codex space marines. Absolutely loads to cover then, so let's jump into it, and we'll start with the troops. So first up we have the standard intercessors, and as with the rest of the troops, I'd typically be looking to field them in 5 man squads. That generally seems to be the best way for troops units, you can sit on more objectives that way. They're less vulnerable to morale, and they fill up more detachment slots. In general with troops you would typically want a few of them, but not to go absolutely overboard. They're going to be good for objectives and durability, though they're not usually your primary damage output. Maybe just very roughly somewhere between 1 and 4 units within a 2000 point list perhaps. When fielding standard intercessors, I'd be most tempted to take the auto bolt rifles. They have the best generalist damage profile in my opinion, particularly when you're in the tactical doctrine. I might be tempted to go for the regular ones if I was playing ultramarines though. In general I'd typically keep them cheap, they're still capable of bullying most light infantry in combat as they are. You can maybe think about a melee weapon for the sergeant if they're in an assault chapter though. Even 5 points for a power sword could go quite a long way, say for example in Blood Angels. I'll certainly enjoy any character reroll auras from things like captains and lieutenants if you can find them, though I don't think that they're the primary targets that you most need to buff. And as with just about any primaris infantry, they're a great target for transhuman physiology to make them much tougher when they're holding on to those points. Intercessors also have the rapid fire stratagem, two command points for an extra little flurry of bolt shots, maybe not routinely worth it just for damage output, but if it makes the difference between an important enemy unit living or dying, it could be worth the investment. Generally they're quite a nice flexible unit though, they can either hold backfield objectives or move on to the midfield ones and skirmish with enemy light infantry. Next up we have the infiltrators, as with the rest of the troops I'd fill them in 5 man squads and probably not go too overboard with the Phobos troops, usually 1 or 2 units is the sweet spot to get that forward deployment and screen out the enemy in matchups that you need to. Most typically I'd probably just keep them cheap with their stock gear, Maybe you could consider a Helix Gauntlet for a little bit of extra survivability. I don't really think that the comms array is worth building around myself. Even with their auto wounding thing, their damage output really isn't very good. I'd not build around it. I'd think about one command point for transhuman or maybe one command point for smokescreen. They can both help them hold their objectives while doing that precious deep strike screening with their Omni Scramblers. Depending on the matchup, you could also think about sending them to hold home field objectives. If you think your opponent's going to be dropping in threatening troops to take your backfield, then having that grade 12 inch of no deep strikers could potentially save you from being assailed there. Next up we have their cousins the Incursors, a bit cheaper but a bit more melee and no Omni Scrambler. Their unique war gear option is the Haywire Mine, which isn't terrible for the 10 points but I think I'd still typically leave it off and keep them cheap, it just feels a bit unreliable that it's always going to have a decent effect. Otherwise, I'd use them pretty similar to the infiltrators, start them on midfield objectives, ideally in cover, and hold those objectives while skirmishing with enemy light infantry. The assault intercessors are the cheap and fighty primaris troops. Again, I would mostly use them in five man squads, maybe in armies like Black Templars, you could justify building them out a bit more, and maybe treat them like an alternate crusader squad that can fight twice for 2 CP and build them up with some chaplain listeners. Otherwise they're cheap, durable and more dangerous in melee than most of the other Primaris troops. I'd usually just field them stock with chain swords and have them extra good against chopping up light infantry. I guess you could think about something like a power fist or thunder hammer on the sergeant to give them a bit more bite against heavies. I'd be a bit more tempted to do that if I was actually playing in a dedicated assault chapter where they're going to be a bit more threatening. 
You could maybe think about an importer for them, but I'd usually not bother. It just costs a lot for the value of the squad that you're transporting. As always, if you did have characters or chaplain litanies around, it could be handy on them. Though again, I think usually other things are going to be better to build around with damage, though two command points to fight again can opportunistically be really quite nice, particularly if it makes the difference between one important unit living or dying for the opponent. These guys are typically going to want to be a bit more aggressive than the others, advancing towards the centre objectives and being a bit of a counter charge threat, one that's at least fairly durable to get rid of. The heavy intercessors are the chunky 28 point Gravis boys, 140 points for a 5 man squad, and I must admit I would more typically use standard intercessors for their role myself, I just feel that they do a similar job while costing 40 points less. If I was using them just to really try and lock down a home field objective though behind all that Gravis toughness, I'd be most tempted by taking their Hellstorm rifles, 3 shots at strength 5 and 30 inch range is really quite nice, though I do admit the other two bolt rifles have a bit more of a niche with those guys, as they're a bit more likely to be staying still, and also they allow you to get the other heavy bolters, which I think are a bit better. If I chose not to take the Hellstorm rifles, I would probably add on a heavy bolter there. Again, their damage output is okay, though not spectacular, character auras if you can get them are handy. They also do have that stratagem for plus one save against damage one attacks, I think it's unyielding in the face of the foe. In general, these guys don't really want to be going forward, due to being a little bit less proficient in combat per point than standard intercessors. I typically try and have them camp on a home field objective, maybe in cover, and attack enemy light infantry. Finally for the troops choices, we have the tactical squad. Again, I'd more typically use intercessors for the role, but they are very flexible and can fill a lot of options if you really want to use them there. In terms of their weapons and war gear, I feel like the two most valuable upgrades are perhaps the Grav Cannon and the Multi Melter. Those are the ones that I think you get the most bang for the buck on, and seeing as they're a fairly cheap unit, perhaps one of their more optimal roles is sitting on backfield objectives, laying down some fire with those Bolters and a Grav Cannon, just for the same cost as an Intercessor squad. I typically wouldn't really bother with any of the special weapons, melee weapons or pistols, most of them are a bit underwhelming for the points cost, I might be most tempted by the Lightning Claw out of the melee weapons, but the rest of the squad just isn't very good at combat. I guess in theory you could pile these into drop pods or rhinos if you wanted, but both of them kind of feel like a fairly big investment. The drop pods seem like you're not getting as much bang for your buck compared with Stone Guard or Devastators. I guess maybe a cheap rhino with cheap bodies going onto an objective could be worse, but they're certainly not a unit that's going to do very much damage. If I had to use a unit, I think I'd be keeping them cheap, camping on a backfield objective with a grav cannon, trying to get some cover while they're doing so. Moving on to the elite section next, and we'll start out with the aggressor squad, maybe not the most efficient damage dealers out there, though as a bit more of a synergy or melee capable squad, I'd be a bit more tempted to build out beyond minimum, I'd take somewhere between 3 and 5, typically not going to the full 6, just because then you run into coherency issues and extra vulnerability to blast weapons. I wouldn't go too crazy with them, maybe just a single squad with a dedicated combo that you wanted to build around. I feel like at their current cost, the Bolt Storm Gauntlets and Flame Storms are fairly well balanced, depending on whether you want more long range damage, or you want a cheaper squad that's got a bit less range, but also is a bit fightier and tougher for the points. I think maybe the most tempting way I would want to run them would be Salamanders with the Flame Storm Gauntlets, between their various stratagems and their plus one to wound, they can certainly reach some seriously scary anti infantry damage potential either hiding behind cover and jumping out, or maybe using something like Blade Guard to self-sacrifice and keep them protected from the enemy guns. Perhaps another option could be Raven Guard, using their Deep Strike stratagem or their forward deployed Warlord trait. In general, they're not really all that tough for the points, so I'd be trying to get the Alpha Strike and then get some good value both out of their shooting and their combat if possible. Strategic Reserve or a chapter-specific Deep Strike option could be one potential way to get them there. Next we have the Blade Guard veterans, a pretty solid and durable Primaris Elite Infantry Squad, again I'd typically run somewhere between the 3-5 to five man mark, and maybe think about running one or two of these if you were going to. They're quite a nice durable Anvil Assault unit that you could potentially pair with more fast moving elements. War gear wise, their only real option is the Neo Volkite Pistol, which is perhaps a bit so-so, you get more or less what you could pay for, I wouldn't take the Plasma though as it's not very good. Blade Guard are definitely a really nice threatening unit that you can build around, Typically I'd expect to see them moving up with one or two melee characters in support, maybe Rites of War as a Warlord trait for Obsec, rerolls or Chaplain Litanies, and they pair quite nicely with the Judas here who can cover them with a bit of fight slash protection. Apothecaries can also make good value out of them, getting to resurrect one of them each turn. They're potentially one of the better choices for an Impulsor, packing really quite a lot of Primaris threat into a relatively small space of models. 
though I typically just foot slog them myself still. And as ever, transhuman physiology is a nice durability one. Gene Rort might could be an option if you need just that little bit of extra damage. In particular, Blade Guard really get on with White Scars and Corsaro Khan. Extra movement and extra damage on the charge, both are great things. Overall, they're a really nice anvil unit. Slog them up the board, keep to cover if you can, beat down the foe on midfield objectives, and potentially counter charge anything that they're moving up with. Next, we have the Assault Centurions. Very hard hitting, though not really all that durable by 9th edition standards. Typically, I just run them in three man squads. Even just with the three of them, their damage really is quite excessive if you can get them there to deliver it. I'd probably not be too tempted to spam them in any way. Maybe the only exception to that could be Raven Guard. Deep striking assault centurions can still be surprisingly scary. War gear wise, I would typically be taking the Hurricane Bolters on each one. Somewhere between 6 and 12 bolt shots for 10 points per model really is quite nice. The Flamers add extra anti infantry fire, though I suppose he could upgrade to Melter Guns if you've got a good way to deliver them, and he's pretty guaranteed that they're going to get their shots off. Support wise, they aren't a core unit, so they're not that great for characters and things, but you could use Apothecaries to resurrect them perhaps. And typically, being able to deep strike them with Raven Guard is maybe one of my favourite ways to get them there. Though I suppose you could use other outflank type options, maybe strategic reserves or white scars. Ideally, once they pop up, you want to use their massive anti infantry fire to vaporise one infantry unit and hopefully charge a hard target and get to work with those siege drills. Despite their fairly hefty price tag, they can definitely make their points back in a single turn if you get the right targets. Next up, we have the company veterans. Perhaps most notable for their small squads and being able to use the bodyguard rule. Typically a lot of people field these in just small two-man squads, perhaps just one or two units of them, often hiding behind cover on objectives and protecting key characters that can afford to be a bit more adventurous if they're not just going to get sniped or shot. In terms of war gear, you could certainly just keep them cheap, but storm shields add some very decent defence and lightning claws can make them into a mini combat threat if you need them, though I don't think either of them are mandatory to do their job. In general, it can be pretty handy to have a couple of units of these hanging around next to a cluster of characters. It just puts another spanner in the works for your opponents trying to gun them down. And it gets particularly silly with really big threatening characters, things like Iron Hands character dreadnoughts or Ravenwing Talon Masters. Anything with big firepower really likes this kind of crazy protection. If you can have a couple of these camping on an objective out of line of sight while still being just in range of their characters, you've got really quite a good return on a 50 odd point unit. Let's talk about Dreadnoughts next, and we'll start out with the Contemptor. The Codex Contemptor is really quite a limited datasheet, and to be honest I would rather use the Relic Contemptor datasheet from Forge World. Not really the worst option if you are looking to spam a fair bit of ranged fire support. For the Codex datasheet, I'd take the Morty Melter over the Assault Cannon myself, and of the Forge World one, I'd be typically looking at the Last Cannons or Volkites for the arms, comboed with some Cyclone Missile Launchers potentially, and maybe swapping out one of the arms for a melee weapon if you want a bit more of a mixed build dreadnought. If you're taking the range build, they can be part of a big dreadnought castle, probably either taking a captain or a lieutenant, though not both, as you can get the other set of re-rolls from Wisdom of the Ancients for 1 CP if you need it. Having a Master of the Forge Tech Marine on standby is pretty nice for this healing and plus one to hit. And in particular, the Relic Contempt Dreadnoughts are really quite nice in combination with the Iron Hand character stratagem, as we just said, it can make them completely untargetable. In general, for the ranged versions, I'd typically want them out of line of sight turn 1. Moving them into line of sight where you can shoot things on your first turn, likely supported by a character or two, probably with other dreadnoughts as well. Otherwise, in our roster of dreadnoughts from Codex Space Marines, we have the dreadnought and the venerable dreadnought. Out of these two, I would take the venerable dreadnought right now. The numbers just work out slightly better, both in terms of damage and defence with that 6 plus feel no pain as well as Ballistic Skill 2+, plus being a bit better against enemy modifiers. I would still likely go Redemptor Dreadnoughts in priority over these, though. The numbers are just a bit better. In terms of my favourite weapon build, I'd take the Last Cannons and Missile Launcher loadout, though maybe if you're Space Wolves, I do quite like the Shield and Axe combination. You can get a very cheap and fighty Venerable Dreadnought there. As with the Contemptor, you can have them as part of a Dreadnought castle if you'd like. With their long range, they could really stay quite far back, and that could hopefully shield them from a little bit of incoming fire. Again, I'd try and keep them hidden turn 1, then move into line of sight when it's your turn. Next up we have the Ironclad Dreadnought, perhaps not one of the absolute top tier Dreadnoughts around, although it is quite a fun one. I wouldn't really go overboard on these, maybe one or two as disruption melee threats. Again, like most of the Dreadnoughts, they're just not very well balanced against the Redemptor, which remains really good. Weapons wise, I'd be most tempted by the Chain Fist and the Hurricane Bolter combo, 
I'm not really convinced that the extra combat weapon adds quite enough myself. The hunter killers I could go either way on, and I'd leave the assault launchers at home as they don't really do much. Again, they're a core unit, so could get some good buffs. Potentially having a tech marine nearby with that Master of the Forge Warlord trait could make them a bit fightier. And again, they can access a bit of pop-up damage with Wisdom of the Ancients if they need to. Hopefully, if they move up alongside a few other pressing threats, they might be able to overload the enemy's capacity to deal with them, though they are pretty slow moving for an assault-focused unit. Moving on, we have the King of the Space Marine Codex Dreadnoughts, the Redemptor. It's been a common staple in competitive Space Marine lists since the Codex dropped. Spamming three of these into a list with a bit of support really isn't the worst idea, and it's hard to go wrong with. I prefer the Macro Plasma over the Heavy Onslaught Gatling Cannon. I think there's just more value in an average of three or four anti-tank shots compared with the flurry of shots from the Gatling Cannons. And then I both think that the Onslaught Gatling Cannon and the Icarus Pod are well worth the extra five points that they cost each. Between the Storm Bolters and the Frag Storms, I think it's fairly close. I'd probably go for the Storm Bolters myself. In terms of the support, probably a captain is your best bet over a lieutenant, as they can allow you to always be re-rolling those ones with the macroplasma when it's overheating. A master of the forge tech marine to pile on wounds and make one of them hit on twos is nice, and they're very nice with anything that will give them a 5 plus invul save, such as librarians with psychic fortress, or perhaps death watch with that relic shield. For 1 CP, Wisdom of the Ancients can be quite nice to add even more firepower to that firebase. This little formation can then move about the board, has enough generalist firepower to threaten just about most things, and then when the enemy gets too close you can always do a bit of counter charging with that massive D3 plus 3 damage fist. Next up we have the Slims Down Cousin which is the Invicta Tactical Warsuit, maybe not quite on the same level as the Dreadnoughts without the core keyword, if you're using them I'd field 1 or 2, maybe a full 3 if I was taking Ultramarines. In terms of the guns I think that the Auto Cannon's generally the winner, more range strength and damage does it for me, though if you're playing Salamanders, you might rethink that, and generally they're wanting to operate fairly independently. The main stratagem that you'd want to use on them is that Ultramarine's 2 command point rapid redeployment one, basically giving you the best of both worlds. If you get first turn, then you can remain set up very aggressively, and if you don't get first, then you can redeploy them back within your own lines and keep them safe and use them a bit more as a gun platform. It means they're a great unit for Ultramarines, but far less so for everywhere else. You need to put a lot more thought into their deployment if you aren't playing Ultramarines, as it means that you both have to balance the risks of not doing enough damage yourself, with the chance of your vehicle just getting wiped out if you're going second. Next we have the Reavers, definitely one of the Codex Space Marine units that tends to struggle most for their role. If I was fielding them, I really wouldn't go too heavy, as they just don't really do much damage compared with other options, but maybe one small 5-man one as a utility option could be kind of interesting. Wargear wise, I'd typically be more tempted to take the bolt carbines over the combat blades, just for the extra range and because the combat blades don't give you any extra AP. And in terms of upgrades, I'd either just run them very cheap and bare bones, or 2 points extra for the grav shoots. Then I'd probably think about moving them up to the midfield alongside characters or other actual offensive elements, where hopefully they could be kind of useful either for the 2CP terror troops to scare away the enemy's obsec, or shock and awe to make them minus 1 to hit and also cancel Overwatch. They're pretty cheap, so are really quite tough for the points, particularly if you have transhuman physiology on the go. In general, I'd be looking to move them onto contested objectives, for the enemy light infantry, maybe steel obsec in combination with a character with rights of war, maybe. I do feel, though, that just for really quite a lot of roles, you might still have been better off with troop intercessors with obsec in the first place, or elite units that deal more damage. Next up, we have the scouts. Again, I'd field in five-man units, and I would strongly consider the Phobos troops with Obsec as an alternative, as well as better objective scoring, you get more damage, and also they're really quite a lot tougher. I still think scouts are at least kind of interesting though, they are a very cheap forward deploy option to screen out the enemy. If I was running them, I'd take bolters and keep them fairly cheap, probably leaving behind camo cloaks, and almost certainly leaving behind sniper rifles, just as they compare so badly to the eliminators. I guess if you did want a little bit more damage, then maybe a combi weapon or a lightning claw could be considered for the sergeant. In general, I'd use them as a cheap screen that doesn't really matter too much if it dies, probably not support them with anything. I guess if you really think that they might survive, then one command point for smoke screen could potentially help. Hopefully they could encourage the enemy to commit to fight them with a bigger unit, and hopefully you can counter-attack them back and deal more damage than the, what they killed themselves. Next up, let's take a look at some Terminators, and we'll start off with the Relic version. With the Terminator squads, they certainly pack a punch even in small amounts, 
but I feel they are one of the units that if you really want to, you can build around them in a big squad and layer on single unit buffs on them. I would still consider Vanguard Veterans as an alternative though. Terminators are perhaps a fair bit better in Dark Angels than anywhere else. For the Relic version, I quite like that you don't have to take a Power Sword on the Sergeant. I'd be most tempted to field them with Combi Bolter and Lightning Claw or Chain Fist. I feel like Lightning Claw and Combi Bolter really is quite a decent cheap deal for what you get. If you're just going to go for one Chain Fist in the unit though, I guess it might as well be on the squad Sergeant. If you want to amp up their firepower, I think out of the ranged options, I'd go for the Grenade Harness and potentially the Reaper Auto Cannon. I think the damage that you get from both of those for just 5 points extra each really is quite decent. If you are building around them as a big damage dealing piece, then a few characters, either captains or lieutenants for re-rolls or chaplains for litanies, both could be good. Rites of War could also give you some obsec as well while you're holding those points. I'd certainly be considering for 1 CP whether or not to use Fury of the First each time I shot or fought. That's quite an easy way to convert command points into damage. With Terminators, I think it depends on the foe. Against some, you might be best off deep striking against. Against others, it might just be best to slog up the board and onto the middle objectives. Both of those do seem pretty reasonable. If looking at the standard variant of the squad, again, I'd take Chain Fists over regular Power Fists. I feel like the D3 damage, extra AP, and bonus against vehicles really outweigh the standard fist. And unless you've got some way to mitigate the move and shoot penalty, I probably wouldn't bother with the heavy weapons on these guys. Finally, the Teleport Homer for just 5 points I think isn't really too bad for a cheap mobility trick. You might not necessarily use it in every game, but being able to ping the squad back to your deployment zone occasionally could be handy. Otherwise, they're really quite similar to the Relic Terminators, potentially a hard-hitting unit that you could build around if you wanted to. Finally, and perhaps in my opinion the most exciting of the three, is the Terminator Assault Squad. Perhaps not too dissimilar from Blade Guard veterans, they really do feel like a squad that you can build around as a central anvil to the army. Working just fine in 5 model units, but these guys in particular seem to be quite good to build out towards 10 models for, and then just layer as many damage and durability buffs on them as you can. Typically, I'd take more of the Thunder Hammers and Storm Shields over the Lightning Claws. The plus 1 to save from the Storm Shields, coupled with the Terminator armor, and maybe even Light Cover if you're lucky, could make the squad really, really hard to shift. And if you've got a fairly meaty unit, you're largely going to be able to handle most infantry anyway, just through sheer weight of attacks. You potentially could be using really quite a lot of characters to support them. Captains or chaplains for re-rolls, a chief apothecary to maybe set up models back on the table when they've died, maybe have rights of war in there somewhere, and things like Dark Angels or Black Templars can add yet more things onto the unit, like that Pennant of Remembrance for minus one damage. In general, I'd usually be tempted to march them up the board with their layered buffs, and dare the enemy to go onto the midfield objectives in charge range. Next up, we have the Tech Marine Attendants of the Servitors, 30 points for four of them, previously being a bit of a staple in Space Marine lists due to being able to do actions very easily, as well as just being kind of handy to have around for screening and objectives and things. In the latest tournament rules, they're not quite so good for doing certain actions, but still maybe a unit or two could be kind of handy just to have around as a very, very cheap unit. If you can afford to hold a home field objective with a unit of these without having to commit Space Marines to it, it's all well and good. Plus they aren't too bad as a sacrificial sort of speed bump unit to screen with, something Space Marines don't have a ton of. In any case, I just keep them cheap. The heavy weapons just really aren't all that good in terms of damage output, and they certainly don't want any sort of support. Maybe a unit or two just as cheap chaff isn't the worst choice. The Stern Guard Veterans are another one of the bolter arm Space Marines that maybe struggles to compete with the others. If you want foot marines for damage, then Devastators will often do better. And even though their bolters have a bit more AP than Intercessors, not being troops and not having obsec are both major downsides. Perhaps the way I'd be most tempted to field them would be in a big drop pod hammer type unit, maybe of 9 or 10. They do seem to be pretty much the ideal way to spam combi weapons as they get them discounted, so seem to be the unit of choice for loading up with a whole load of combi flamers or melters, and jumping out of the pod to hopefully cause some major damage. If you can support them with any other characters, it's not the worst thing. Maybe you could have a character riding with them in the pod. In particular, I think that that could be quite a good fun strategy for Salamanders, getting their plus one to wound with all that melter or flamer goodness. It is quite pricey though. It'd be 325 points for 10 with the combi melters in a drop pod. Often people tend to prefer Devastators for a similar role. Next up, we have Vanguard Veterans. Perhaps the premier fast-moving Space Marine combat unit right now. I feel these can be fairly flexible and loadout. Five model squads work just fine, but more isn't necessarily the worst thing to maybe just give them critical mass against certain other high value assault units. Definitely a unit that you could take a whole load of multiples of, and people often do. 
War gear wise, it's not hard to see why people often fall back on jump pack, storm shield, and lightning claws. All of them are really good value. The jump pack's excellent for the movement. The storm shield makes the squad enormously tougher per point, and the lightning claw punches up quite well against hard targets, as well as handling horde infantry really nicely. Other than those, the things that would most tempt me are things like power fists or thunder hammers. They make the unit a bit more threatening against hard targets, and the relic blade isn't too bad on the sergeant either. I'd really not bother with any pistols on them, you could even take double chain swords if you wanted to keep the unit nice and cheap. These guys get on absolutely great with fast moving captains or chaplains, either with jump packs or bikes, you could have rights of war on a character for obsec, and chaplain melee buffs can make these guys go absolutely through the roof. For assault chapters you might want to pay 2 command points to activate their assault doctrine earlier, and bear in mind that for 1 command point they can use melter bombs as well to throw a few mortal wounds onto vehicles. In general, I'd be looking to start these on the board, rounding them up from cover to cover, then hopefully being able to tangle with and bring down some of the hardest hitting forces in the opponent's army. Certainly one of the stronger units within Codex Space Marines. Next we come to the Veteran Intercessors, a few more points over the regular troops ones that gets you an extra attack, though again I do think that they fall into the Eclipsed Space Marine units section, they miss the Obsec and the Troops Detachment slot filling and they don't really handle a range of targets very well, unlike most of the other elites. I feel like both of their major options are pretty good, the Astartes Chainsword or the Bolters, I think you could argue for both of those, and as with the regular Intercessors, if I was taking Bolt Rifles, I would be taking the Auto Bolt Rifles. Unlike the Intercessors, seeing as you're paying the premium for the extra attack, I think you may as well take a fancy melee weapon for the Sergeant. It's pretty much a fighty character in his own right that way, you get 5 attacks with a Thunder Hammer out of just one model. In terms of support, I guess they're one of the more reasonable choices to put it in an Impulsor, a fairly fragile but slightly more hard-hitting Intercessor squad. Any character bonuses would certainly help out, Transhuman Physiology is good, and they can also Rapid Fire if they need to in a pinch. Generally though, their profile is going to make them a bit more effective against bullying light infantry as opposed to going after heavies, though I guess a fancy power weapon could give them a bit of sting against hard targets. Finally for the Elite section, we have the Elite's Choice Characters, Starting with the Space Marine Ancients, perhaps overall as a class I do feel that the Ancients are fairly overshadowed and will probably be one of my lowest priority characters for most chapters I think. I'd say maybe the single best use is using either the Terminator or Bladeguard Ancient in the Dark Angel's Deathwing and using its Great Pennant of Remembrance banner to give minus one damage. If you're just running a normal one though, maybe a Primaris Ancient with the Power Sword and the Burning Blaze could be an interesting choice. At least that way you've got a model that both provides a buff and is also pretty threatening in combat as well, even if you have to invest a bit. Otherwise for choices, I'd not usually bother with the chapter ancient upgrade, I don't really think it adds enough, though they could be a good choice for any spare warlord traits or relics that you need bearing, something that you want to have somewhere in an army and maybe could be good for buffing nearby units. The blade guard ancient is an okay buff to blade guard squads of course, giving them plus one to hit as well as the fights and death thing. Though I feel that people would generally be looking more towards things like captains who can also fight well too. And otherwise if you're just trying to make the most out of the banner ability, they want to be supporting an infantry gun line like Hellblasters, Intercessors or Devastators. And hopefully making them shoot in death. If you can combine that death shooting with some character rerolls, potentially you do have a fair amount of power to hit the enemy in their turn. If you can target that shooting against something that hasn't attacked yet, then you could be getting some good value out of it theoretically I guess. Still though, I do feel that probably the best use of it is maybe a Blade Guard Ancient for Dark Angels. That minus one damage is very nice. Next up we have Apothecaries. I'd probably just take the one of these somewhere in the army if you do have a fair amount of decent squads to heal and resurrect. I don't think there's really much in it between the regular one and the Primaris version. I think for the extra 5 points for an extra wound, the Primaris one isn't bad though. I'd certainly consider the Jump Sanguinary Priest and the Ravenwing Apothecary from Dark Angels and Blood Angels too. Typically for Apothecaries I'd usually upgrade to the Chief one and take the Selfless Healer trait, that means that you can just automatically bring back one model per turn by getting that stratagem for free, and I would consider any relics that can boost their Feel No Pain type aura like the Vox Spiritum. they can be a really good choice for something like the Crusader Helm in Black Templars. The regular one could potentially take the Teeth of Terror as well if you want to make your Apothecary somewhat decent in fighting too. Generally I want to be running them alongside some sort of big meaty multi wound infantry, maybe Terminators, Gravis Armour Marines, or bikes or attack bikes, and sometimes you can do quite fun slightly gamey things with the revival, say putting them close to the enemy at the start of the turn, which will lead to you having less charge distance later on. 
Hopefully over the course of the game they shall be able to mitigate damage or save enough marines to justify themselves, as well as providing one more annoying character for your opponent to deal with. Next up we have the company champion, again I'd probably take no more than just the one of these, usually the case with space marine characters, they all do tend to have diminishing returns. Company champions are a cheap and feisty little character, though I'd certainly consider them against captains who have fairly similar melee but also provide buffs as well. Company champions really can be quite threatening though, I'd definitely upgrade to the chapter champion for just the 15 points, I think that's a very good return, and then you can make them very destructive with the Imperium Sword and maybe the Blade of Triumph special relic that they can take, that does get you some pretty vicious attacks at strength 8 and damage 3. Otherwise, if you didn't go for Imperium Sword, you could use Martial Exemplar to help support Assault Armies, there aren't an enormous amount of things that allow you to re-roll charges within the Space Marines arsenal. In general, they'd want to lurk within your battle lines, maybe working in concert with other characters, not be targeted, but then step up to the plate as soon as the opponent gets near. Their bigger heroic intervention rule certainly can make them quite hard to approach if they're trying to charge units around them. If they get killed before their attack, they could be a decent choice for fighting and death for 2 CP. Lastly for the Elite's Choice characters, we have the Judicia. Again, probably not really one that's worth taking in multiples. He's a moderately fighty character whose main purpose in life is just to bring the fight's last ability to the Space Marines and he doesn't really have any options besides Warlord traits and relics. First but priority for those I think would be to get anything that can extend his heroic intervention range, there are a fair few Warlord traits out there that do that, and it's far more relevant on him, because that means that the opponent will really struggle to approach him that well, in fear of fighting last and your own Space Marines cutting them down first. Otherwise, Rites of War or the Imperium Sword are both fairly reasonable choices I think. Ideally, I think that the Judicia pairs best with a melee unit with a small footprint, maybe Blade Guard or Assault Terminators perhaps, something that no matter where the enemy approaches from, there's a good chance that the Judicia is going to be able to heroic intervene and then get that Tempera Mortis ability off. It can mean that a lot of enemy units just flat out can't charge yours, for fear of fighting last and being killed first. Generally I'd be moving up with a unit like that, protecting them as they get into combat, and hopefully executing a few elite infantry with that blade. Moving on, let's go for the fast attack choices next, and first we have the Assault Squad. If I was fielding them, I'd typically go for small 5-man squads for more utility units, jumping around doing actions and things. Typically, if I actually wanted jump pack marines, I'd certainly take Vanguard veterans over these right now. In terms of war gear, I'd basically always take the jump packs, otherwise there wouldn't be a ton of reasons not to run Assault Intercessors instead. A boosted stat line, more attacks and obsec are just so much better. And in terms of upgrades, there isn't a whole load that's too exciting. Maybe a lightning claw on the sergeant, maybe the flamers could be a bit more tempting with a fast moving platform, it's a bit depressing that the eviscerator really is quite fun, though I just really don't think it's all that strong for the cost. I wouldn't be looking too hard to support them with loads of stuff, maybe they could try and opportunistically finish off a vehicle with melter bombs, and I think if I were including assault squads in the army, it would primarily be to try and do actions and objectives, as they just don't fight really all that well compared with bamvets. Next up we have the attack bikes. Perhaps some of the stars of the fast attack section here. I could pretty happily field them in any squads between 1 to 3. Units of 1 are pretty good just for zipping around and jumping on objectives and things while doing decent firepower. Units of 3 are nicer if you're going to buff them somehow. Certainly a unit that you could take multiple of if you wanted to. I'd pretty much always go for the multi melter over the heavy bolter. I think it's just a lot better for the points. And I feel with support you could go fairly heavy or fairly light. If you're using bigger units, then being within character or wisdom of the ancient auras isn't the worst. Apothecaries could even theoretically resurrect them, bringing 60 points of model back to the table, and one command point to fall back and shoot could often be worth it. In game, I'd be trying to use their speed to get the first strike, and if it makes sense, then zipping them onto a far flung objective could be quite good and scoring some points at a key time. Next up, we have the bike squad, not quite as dangerous. I'd usually use small units of three of them and they're particularly good value in Ravenwing where they get obsec. In terms of war gear, I'd pretty much always replace their pistols with Astartes chainswords, getting AP-1 melee and more attacks just wins. Again, a lightning claw could be an interesting cheap choice to make the unit a little bit more dangerous in combat, otherwise I think I'd keep them cheap, I think their special weapons are a bit questionable in terms of how much they're worth the points, and the attack bikes might have quite different purposes to what the rest of the bike squad wants to do. Generally, I'd use their speed to operate quite independently from characters or buffs. It could get a minus 1 to hit for 1 CP if they're advancing and they want to stay safer. And generally, throughout the game, I think they want to bully light infantry and seal objectives if they can. Maybe a bit so-so in most chapters, but really quite decent in Dark Angels. 
Next up we have the Invader ATV, 85 points with a multi-melter, I'd usually fill these just in units of one, and I would typically take the multi-melter over the Onslaught Gatling Cannon, though if you are hurting for anti-infantry, I don't think there's really all that much in it. As a Primaris unit, they can use Transhuman Physiology to keep a bit safer, and they are a fairly sturdy unit for throwing onto objectives, taking a fair bit more firepower to bring down than attack bikes for example. They can't really get all that much buffs or synergy, besides maybe some Apothecary Feel No Pain and Healing, though no Resurrections anymore. Again, like quite a lot of the fast attack, they're typically happier operating a bit more independently and going out of character aura buffs. Next we have the land speeders. Again, I typically feel these in one model units and kind of have a similar sort of role to the ATV. Maybe a little bit less tanky with a couple of wounds less, but they generally hit a tiny bit harder. Again, I take the multi melter over the heavy bolter and then either just leave it at that or maybe upgrade to the tornado variant with an assault cannon or a heavy flamer. I feel the Typhoon version is just a little bit expensive for a 6 wound model. Again, they're a fast unit that can deal a bit of firepower while zipping onto far flung objectives. They're not really going to carry the entire battle line, but that's not really their point. I do quite like the Multi Melter and Heavy Flamer version, which would work pretty nicely with Salamanders. Next up, we have Storm Speeders, the new for 9th edition Primaris Imbigans Land Speeder. They hit reasonably hard for their cost following a couple of points decreases, though are still very fragile. I would keep their numbers fairly low, again they're not really going to be carrying a battle line, and as with a few of the other fast moving gun platforms here, I will be considering attack bikes as an alternative platform. Out of the three, I prefer the heavier hitting thunder strike and hammer strikes over the hail strike, I feel we get a fair bit more bang for your buck on the anti-tank weapons, and in general I think they want to be zipping around the board on supporters, hopefully hidden from the vast majority of the enemy army, and just peeking out to hit one enemy target each turn, hopefully while staying safe. If they get tagged in combat, they can fall back and shoot for 1 CP, but I feel if they're taking any significant damage, they're going to die quite quickly. Next up, we have the Inceptors, who I feel can work really quite differently depending on whether you're equipping the cheaper Assault Bolters or the more expensive Plasma Exterminators. If you're taking the Assault Bolters, they're quite cheap at 40 points. I'd use them in small units of 3, and have them as relatively mobile jumping troubleshooters to deal with enemy chaff units trying to break your lines or maybe even deep strike them to achieve some actions or contest objectives. For the plasma version, I'd be a bit more tempted to potentially even build out to bigger squads, despite them being really expensive. They can put out a horrendous amount of fire against medium infantry, particularly anything that they trigger the blast rule against. It's almost mandatory that they need a captain or another sort of re-roll ones though, otherwise they're going to fry themselves all dead as soon as they overheat. And if you happen to be playing Dark Angels, they're a unit that gets on really well with the extra damage from weapons of the Dark Age. For those ones, I'd be a bit more tempted to either deep strike, or maybe start on the board if you've got extra mobility, maybe if you're playing white scars. Next we have the Outriders, who are locked to squads of 3. Again, not really a unit that I'd go too heavy on, their stats aren't really particularly overwhelming even compared with standard bikes. Sadly the squad also doesn't have any war gear choices either, the sergeant certainly wishes he could take a melee weapon though. With a flurry of attacks, they can certainly be helped out by bike captains or chaplains for re-rolls or plus one to wound or something. And like the regular bikes, I'd use them as fast-moving skirmishers to try and take out enemy infantry off objectives. I bear in mind that these guys absolutely really want the charge though. They don't want to be charged themselves, otherwise they're going to be losing attacks. Scout bikes, I feel kind of similarly to the previous two bike units. Keep them small in units of three models, and again low unit numbers for utility purposes as they do pay a bit of a premium for their mobility. I'd not really bother upgrading them myself, they do put out a fairly efficient amount of anti-infantry fire up close anyway, I'd leave off grenade launchers and keep them cheap. Again, I'd not really want to buff them either, just have them operate independently and bully light infantry off objectives with close range shooting. I think in general most people will probably be taking the regular bike squad over these guys though. Losing the 3 plus armor save is one thing, but going down to 2 wounds is really quite painful. Finally for the fast attack we have the suppressors, the jump devastators with the auto cannons. They're limited to units of 3 for 100 points and again I'd take low numbers of them for the utility, though their damage output is fairly long range and slightly flexible. I think they generally want to operate fairly independently, bounding around somewhere safe at the flanks of the army, maybe doing objectives or actions if they can, and hopefully trying to find positions where they can shoot but not be shot too much as their durability isn't great. You could potentially use smokescreen or transhuman physiology to make them a bit tougher, but I'm still not sure that that's necessarily going to save them against most attacks. Heavy support next, and first we have the Centurion Devastators. 
Again, really quite an expensive unit, not exactly the most efficient out of the Space Marine Arsenal, particularly as they can't get most buffs with not being core. Depending on what you have available to help them out, I'd take a squad between 3 or 5 of them. If you do have any stratagems or options within the codex that can be used on them, they are a pretty interesting unit to do so, as they are one of the priciest and heaviest hitting Space Marine infantry units costing loads and loads of points. I'd argue that the Grav Cannons may be the best value for the arms, and the Hurricanes and the Missiles both seem fairly balanced for the chest armaments, probably the Hurricane Bolters being the better option if you're thinking about getting them in close, and the Missiles being better for longer range duties. If you're playing Imperial Fist though, they are one of the units that you can get tons and tons of bolt shots out of, so usually going to be an interesting one for them. Within Codex Space Marines, there isn't a whole ton that really works for them. Wouldn't hurt to have an Apothecary around though, they could potentially restore some very valuable models to the field. Turn 1, I'd want to have these guys out of line of sight, then move up and lay down some fire in your first turn. Hopefully if they can also gain some light cover while doing so, it should be at least a little bit more challenging to remove. Next up we have the more normal Devastator squad, who appear to be more efficient dropping from the skies in drop pods, as opposed to being more traditional gunline units, at least in 9th. I typically field them in minimum 5 model formation, and I feel that their most efficient weapons are the Grav Cannons and the Multi Melters, doing some of the best damages per point. In any case, I'd certainly always take that Armorium Cherub. If you do take a couple of different weapons, then you can use it on the one that's most relevant for the target that you need to kill. Perhaps one of the most typical loadouts for Devastators are two units of them bundled into a drop pod, perhaps with a mix of Grav Cannons and Multi Melters, and if possible, in a chapter that's going to have something to stop the minus one penalty that they get with moving, say like Iron Hands. Otherwise, you'll get those weapons in range either just by starting on the board and popping out, maybe with some cheap Grav Cannons, or maybe using something like Strategic Reserve. If you can drop them into Character Aura range, that's only going to be a good thing as well though. If you're going down the drop pod, I'd usually be aiming to drop in Turn 1 in Devastator Doctrine and destroy something key before it hits you, hopefully landing them in an area that's fairly hard to deal with and might make your opponent have to move things to deal with them, though a lot of the time they are going to be one-hit wonders. Next we have the Eliminator Squad, which you have to field in units of three. I do really quite like Eliminators, I think one or two units is usually going to be helpful for a fair few Space Marine lists, particularly if you're not running Phobos troops. I quite like them as they're cheap enough to be an expendable chaff unit to screen back the enemy. They're relatively durable with those camo cloaks when they're in cover, more so than most Space Marines for the cost, and their sniper fire can be legitimately quite threatening to any army with lighter characters on the table. If you're using them as a bit more of a utility role, I'd strongly consider that instigator bolt carbine. It does reduce your damage a little bit, but being able to move, shoot, move every turn is really quite nice. It can get them hurtling across the table pretty quickly, or even just bobbing in and out of cover so they can't be shot, but shoot themselves. Typically, I'd not be looking to support them too much. For one CP, they could use transhuman physiology if they're attacked, and I think it's often going to depend on the opponent's army as to how you try to use them in any given game. I'm really not that big a fan of the last few Zools, though. Their damage output just doesn't really stack up against things like Eradicators. Space Marines have better anti-tank choices out there. Talking of which, we come to the Melter Obliterators of the Space Marines, the Eradicators. Generally I'd be looking to keep them in small squads of 3 due to their total obliteration rule, as that means that you don't want to split fire, and small units means that you're rarely going to be overkilling your target too badly. You could always take a big unit of 6 and choose to combat squad them though I suppose. I feel they are a unit that you could take multiple squads of, maybe 1 or 2 to cover anti-tank duties. I wouldn't go too heavy on them though, as they're not going to do all that much against infantry. Weapons wise, I feel like all of their loadouts are quite nice. The Melter Rifle and the Heavy Melter Rifle I think are fairly well balanced. If you're running a chapter that has a way to negate the minus one to hit from moving and shooting though, then I think that the Heavy Melter Rifle quite comfortably wins out, say if you're playing Ultramarines. The Multi Melter for a 10 point upgrade also seems like a really quite reasonable one too. Having four Melter shots coming out of a 55 point model is very threatening indeed. If you can get them near to characters, then they'll certainly enjoy the rerolls. Command rerolls on their damage results could be of worse use, and they can also use transhuman physiology or unyielding if they do want a bit of extra durability. Typically, I think they'd want to be hiding behind cover, then moving out to gun down nearby armoured threats. The challenge might be to get them in range of some really good targets, and I feel they might be one of the best units to come out of strategic reserve for Space Marines. With a 24 inch range, it's quite likely that they'll be able to pop up somewhere useful on the table. The Plasma Incinerating Hellblasters are next. Again, perhaps not one of the premier damage output units of Codex Space Marines, but some people do like them. Again, I'd be typically building round squads of five of them, 
I guess maybe you could justify more if you had a specific plan. Maybe Dark Angels with Weapons of the Dark Age could be a bit more tempting. Out of the three plasma incinerators, I think that the assault ones are currently the strongest. You get really quite a nice volume of fire out of them at a good range and on the move. They're actually not too bad a choice for dealing with certain meta targets at the moment, say like Custodes and Tau. I'd certainly not bother with the plasma pistol on the sergeant though, you're rarely going to get to fire it. Again, like the plasma inceptors, I think that having a captain nearby to re-roll those ones is near mandatory. And I guess if you were to go all in on trying to make them work, maybe they could be one of the better choices for an impulsor as well, to deliver their guns to a place where they can get some good lines of sight. In general, they will chew up heavy infantry and other space marines really quite nicely. You just have to ensure that you're actually striking first and not the other way around. As for their points cost, they're really fairly fragile. The fast track servo turret is perhaps a unit that's needed a buff since it came out. If I had to run them, I'd go for individual units rather than squadrons, though I would certainly consider other fire support choices. Neither being core nor even particularly efficient, it's really not in a great place right now. Out of auto cannons or last talons, I'm more tempted by the auto cannons of the two. At least they're really quite long range. Last talons only at 24 inches aren't ideal on a platform only moving three. Ideally, I'd be trying to set them up on an objective, hopefully somewhere that still has decent lines of fire, and use those auto cannons to hunt down medium infantry and light vehicles. The Thunderfire Cannon was again a unit that got some very heavy nerfs from 8th edition. They're certainly not very popular within Space Marine lists, I wouldn't be using more than one of them, and if I was using one, it'd be primarily for their Tremor Shell stratagem. Wargear wise, they don't actually have any choices on the data sheet, though they've gone a good bear a few helpful relics or warlord traits. Maybe something like a command point farming one that you needed on the board but to be kept safe. In game their damage output is a little bit weedy, could certainly flatten a few light infantry I guess, though potentially that one command point tremor shell stratagem could be more valuable than that. Halving the movement and slowing advance and charges on a key unit could potentially keep something important out of the fight for a turn. Next up we have the space marine vehicles, pretty much all of which aren't in an amazing place right now, though some are certainly better than others. I'd argue that gladiator tanks are perhaps one of the better ones, maybe one buffed up by a tech marine might have some good value, and out of the three variants I'd go for the reaper or the valiant over the lancer, they just do a massive amount more damage for the points cost I think. In terms of upgrades I think you certainly could just keep them cheap, but both the iron hail heavy stubber and the rocket pod seem well worth it for 5 points apiece. I'd probably leave off the auto launchers, though I guess it could be worse and could make it quite a bit more durable against some matchups. As I said, one supported by a tech marine could be hitting on twos and also get some regeneration and healing, and maybe could be a nice target for things like targeted buffs like the Iron Hands Ironstone for minus one damage as well. As bear in mind Grav Pulse for stopping it being charged as easily and also being able to fall back and shoot, both of which are really quite handy things to be able to do. As with quite a lot of the Space Marine battle tanks, I try and hide them turn one and then use their movement to get in range, the Reaper shredding infantry, and the Valiant having plenty of decent anti-tank shots. Next we come to the Repulsor, the primaris tank that's just absolutely bristling with guns. Certainly not very strong in game, and I wouldn't be running multiple. If you are running one, I'd probably have one buffed up with lots of things, like a tech marine in tow. The Repulsor's got about a million different options on its datasheet, but here's my rough take on them. I prefer the last cannons over the heavy bolters. I'd take the extra heavy stopper for 5 points. I feel the heavy onslaught Gatling cannon is probably better over the last talon for the extra points it costs. I could happily either take or leave the regular onslaught Gatling cannon versus the Iron Hail heavy stubber. I'd go for the storm bolters over the frag storms for a bit more range. I'd take the Icarus rocket pod over the Icarus Iron Hail heavy stubber. And if I was only fielding one of these, I would probably keep the auto launchers for smokescreen. Though if you just wanted maximal random shots going off, the frag storm grenade launchers also seem fine. Kind of hilarious that this thing has seven different bullet points for weapons and options. Again, this one's pretty much similar to the gladiators, tech marines, iron stones, grav pulses and smoke screens, all are fairly reasonable to try and keep it safe. For the points cost, it's really not durable at all though. It ideally wants to be having multiple turns of firepower while hiding away from any decent enemy anti-tank, which might not be the easiest thing to do. The repulse executioner is in a similar fairly bad spot. You don't really want to be comparing this to a storm surge, which potentially costs less points depending on upgrades. For the choices on this guy, I'd probably go for the Macro Plasma over the Heavy Laser Destroyer at the moment. I feel more shots at damage 3 are probably going to be more useful than 2 at damage D3 plus 3. And again with upgrades like the Redemptor and the Gladiator, I think both the Iron Hail Stubber and the Icarus Rocket Pod 
are both pretty reasonable for 5 points. Again, absolutely wants to stay away from anything that can kill it, and hopefully get multiple turns of fire out of all of those guns. Next up we have the Space Marine Anti-Air for the Hunter and Stalker. The Hunter is just a unit that doesn't really do its given job particularly well. I'd certainly be considering other fire support instead of this, but if you decided to use one, I'd probably not run more than one, and just pray that enemy aircraft turn up, as otherwise you've just paid for an unnecessarily expensive last cannon really. I'd probably take the Hunter Killer Missile and Storm Bolter, just so it can actually have a little bit more threat on the table, but in general the Hunter's just a spectacularly inefficient unit right now. If you really had to go something that's dedicated anti-air, I think the Stalker is a fair bit better. Again, a bit over-specialised, unless you expect every single army to be packing planes. And again, I think that the extra guns don't really hurt to add on. At least those Icarus cannons are maybe a bit more multi-purpose, and could lend at least a little bit of fire against ground troops. Next up in our lineup of slightly mediocre Space Marine vehicles, we have the Predators. Certainly a unit that's been feeling the pinch of Codex creep really quite a lot. If I were fielding one, I feel that both the turrets are fairly well balanced. In general though, I think I'd go for the last cannons over the auto cannons, though I don't think there's too much in it. I'd likely couple them with the spons and last cannons, unless you're playing Imperial Fists or something, as otherwise you're left with a tank that really doesn't have all that much threat with just the turret weapon. In general, I feel Predators are just maybe a little bit too cheap to justify too many buffs on. I suppose you could maybe think about a Tech Marine if you had a fair few vehicles. And in general, I'd be trying to use its fairly long range to sit well back in the army, hopefully out of range of a lot of enemy counterattacks, and plink away at heavy targets with the last cannons. The Vindicator is a tank I have a little bit more time for, maybe using one as a bit of a distraction threat to have the enemy deal with it instead of dealing with other stuff in your army could be worse. As tanks go, at least it is actually fairly tanky. With a siege shield for an extra 10 points, it's going to be toughness 8 and a 2 plus save versus ranged attacks which isn't too bad for 140 points I guess. The Storm Bolter also seems kind of fine to include if you want to. Maybe while it's going about trying to make a spectacle of itself, a 1 command point for Smokescreen could be worse. In game I think about firing Vindicators fairly early compared with the other vehicles, they are very swingy with those Demolisher Cannons, sometimes they can have spectacular damage, other times they can just completely whiff. Next up we have the Whirlwind, I take no more than one of these, and mainly for using the Whirlwind Stratagem. In terms of missile choice, I'd go for the Castellan missiles and keep them a bit cheaper. They're still okay for clearing out enemy chaff infantry when you get over the enormous premium that you're paying for Ignore's line of sight. I'd not bother with things like Storm Bolters or Hunter Killer missiles, as you are likely going to be wanting to hide this thing. The tank's a bit cheap to bother with any sort of character support for, and each turn I'd be looking to deal out a bit of Ignore's line of sight anti-infantry damage, or hopefully if your troops are going to be engaging in combat, you could hands out fights last to something important hopefully meaning that you can charge two different targets on two different sides of the board and be safe from your opponent interrupting. It makes the Whirlwind a slightly more popular choice for assault heavy armies, things like Black Templars or Blood Angels weirdly. Rounding out the heavy support section we have the Land Raiders. Again despite a couple of points cuts it's really not very overwhelming. I think these things just really need a rules rewrite to make them usable on the board. I wouldn't be running multiple as they really feel like they're priced as a luxury choice that does transport plus guns. And out of the three variants, I prefer the regular and redeemer patterns over the Crusader, and I could happily either take or leave both the Storm Bolter and the Multi Melter on the chassis. In general, with their damage defence and being locked up in combat, Land Raiders are always going to struggle if they want to both do transporting and guns. I guess if you did have a fairly vicious firstborn unit within it, then it could be kind of problematic to deal with. Black Templars can potentially make them a bit more interesting as they can get out after the Land Raiders moved. Again, I guess in theory you could buff it with things like Tech Marines or the Ironstone. It is a pretty big meaty unit, so I guess that could be something. In game, I'd be looking to use it as a battlefield bunker to charge from, while also providing fire support, while hopefully trying to stop the enemy just locking it up with some sort of chaff infantry. Next, we'll move on to the transports. Starting off, we have the Drop Pod, which we've already covered a little bit on the Stern Guard and the Devastator reviews. Balanced enough that you could maybe justify one of them for an alpha strike for a key unit. I probably wouldn't get into running multiple though, as I feel that that would likely be overkill. I'd usually go for the Storm Bolter over the Death Wind, as it's at least got a little bit more range and the things are mobile. Both of them are fairly well balanced though, I think. And as we talked about in other sections, I think probably the best choice is Devastator squads with grabs and melters. Though maybe a big Stern Guard squad with flamers or melters could also be interesting in Salamanders perhaps. I'd aim to drop in turn 1 for an alpha strike, deliver the marines to where they can kill something important, 
and if the drop pod can drop onto an objective as well, then so much the better to give your opponent one more annoying thing to remove. Next up we have the Impulsor. Again, if I was going to use one, it would probably just be the one. Really not quite cheap enough to spam in my opinion. And just use it to deliver one high value Primaris Infantry Squad to where it needs to be. War gear wise, the vast majority of people tend to go with the Shield Dome, as the most important things for transports are to be fast and durable. So perhaps just paying for yet more guns isn't really the most necessary. Having said that, I do both like the Iron Hail Sky Talon Array. It's quite good for the amount of shots that you get for the amount of points. And I do feel that the Orbital Comms Array is perhaps overlooked. For just 15 points you could be spitting out really quite a fair amount of random scattered mortal wounds with that. Seems pretty unlikely that you wouldn't be able to make back your investment in that whenever it's fired. Otherwise I'd generally take the Storm Bolters over the Frag Storm Grenade Launchers. In terms of contents, you'd be looking at the highest value Primaris Infantry, Blade Guard, Hell Blasters, or maybe Black Templar Sword Brethren might be good candidates. The Blade Guard to use it as a bit of a battlefield bunker to assault out of, and the Hell Blasters actually making use of the Assault Vehicle special rule, getting a really big movement and still being able to shoot just fine. Otherwise, it's still perhaps not the worst just for pinging some Intercessors or Assault Intercessors on an objective. You get a serious amount of movement with the Obsec with this. As it's got a transport of 6, you could also put a character in there potentially, maybe a Captain or a Judicia to accompany some Blade Guard. Again, like the other Primaris tanks, it does have Grav Pulse, which potentially could surprise your opponent if they do decide to include this in a charge opportunistically. In general though, I'd usually filled it as 125 points with a Shield Dome, maybe including the Iron Hail Stubber for an extra 5. Next we get to the Firstborn Transports with the Rhino, a decent enough cheap expendable transport, I'd say its main issue is perhaps just competing with the drop pot that can deliver the highest value space marines maybe a bit more reliably. And for assault units like Vanguard veterans, they've got jump packs. Still though, as a transport, I think it's reasonably decent. The extra storm bolter seems kind of worth it for an upgrade. Then at least you've got a transport that's somewhat dangerous to light infantry. I guess I'd be most tempted to put Devastators, Stern Guard or Vanguard vets without jump packs here. Though I think most of the time they're generally going to want to be elsewhere. If you are using it with one of them though, then I just aim to deliver whatever it needs to, either in range of the enemy or into combat, and then you've got a cheap, relatively tough little expendable vehicle, just to stream with, or maybe do nuisance charges with. The Razorback's just very similar to the Rhino, only 6 transport slots, but you get a gun on top. In general, I'd typically be preferring 2 filled Rhinos over them, just as then you have a transport that isn't really confused in its role, and very happily just moving forward being expendable. I feel that the guns on the top are fairly well balanced between the three of them. The assault cannons, las cannons and heavy bolters all do their job as well. And besides those, I'd probably not add on any storm bolters or hunter killer missiles. I just keep it fairly cheap. Otherwise, it's basically similar to the Rhino, except rather than just eating it into combat or screening with it, it's generally going to want to hang back and do some fire support once it's done its transporting. Finally, for transports, we have the Scout one in the Land Speeder Storm. 55 points for a unit that stands up surprisingly well in its own right, being surprisingly tanky at 7 wounds, very quick, and still putting out a small amount of anti-infantry fire with the Heavy Bolter and Cerberus Launcher. Interestingly, they see a fair bit of play just literally as a unit to move around and grab objectives, rather than doing anything fancy about transporting scouts. A really nice fast expendable Space Marine unit. It also comes with a handy debuff stratagem, cancelling Overwatch and getting minus 1 to hit. If you did want to run them with a contingent of scouts, I might go with the shotgun ones. Cruising around and lighting up some light infantry does sound kind of fun, but in general probably running them empty and jumping onto objectives, forcing bad trades for the opponent, isn't the worst idea. Next we have a trio of Space Marine Flyers, all of which aren't super strong for the points right now. Perhaps even more so than most of the Flyers in 9th edition, they do really pay a premium for their mobility. For the Stormhawk Interceptor, I take the Heavy Bolters and Last Talon configuration. That gives you a really general purpose flyer that can deal with really quite a lot of threats between those and the Assault Cannons. And I'd maybe use one or two of them to use their good movement to hit hidden units or even snipe enemy characters. The challenge would be to try and actually stay alive for a few turns to be able to do that without just getting shot down straight away. Maybe it's not too different from the Storm Talon gunship. For the side armament, I'd probably take the Last Cannons with the Assault Cannon. Again, that allows it to handle a fair range of targets, though still isn't particularly efficient for the cost, I think. Potentially, it could hover around in hover mode in the backfield for a turn or so, if it made sense and it could stay safe. Otherwise, jumping around to get line of sight or maybe even sniping characters could be okay. Finally, we've got the Storm Talent gunship, which due to its massive cost, I wouldn't really be taking any more than one. 
I think there's a fair bit of merit to most of the guns, depending on what you want to target. Perhaps the biggest standouts for me, though, are the twin heavy plasma cannon and the twin multi-melter. Both of those, I think, give you a really good return on investment. And then Hurricane Bolters getting 24 shots for 30 points also is pretty excellent. Despite good weapons, I still don't think it really adds up to a particularly efficient unit, just because the platform is so expensive. 340 points for only 14 toughness 7 wounds. The thing is also a transport as well, so I guess for a bit more of a fun build, he could load it up with threatening close assault troops and fly it towards the enemy. I would just be absolutely amazed though, seeing how expensive it is, plus the expense of the models within, if the opponent just doesn't shoot it straight down. For the fortification, we have the Hammer 4 Bunker. It gets a couple of slightly inaccurate big missile shots. Combined with the Heavy Bolter or Heavy Flamer shots, they hit everything within range. It doesn't really have the numbers to make it good enough at small 2000 point games. Maybe if you know that you're playing a really massive game though, and there's not going to be much terrain around, then perhaps it could be worth it. I take the heavy bolter arrays over the heavy flamers, as otherwise it's just going to be very easy to avoid for most units, and there's not really all that much that you can do with it besides just plonk it down with good lines of sight and hope for the best. Rounding up, we get to the Codex Space Marines HQ choices, starting off with the Captain, maybe one of the ones that's a bit more justifiable to field more than one of them. They're pretty efficient with their buffs, damage outputs, and a 4 plus invul for defense, but the detachment limit means that you can only field one per detachment. Space Marine Captains have a massive ton of data sheets within Codex Space Marines. After the builds available, probably my favorite ones are the Primaris Indomitus pattern one with the Relic Shield and Power Sword, or the ones with a bit more mobility, either the Bike Captain for the extra toughness and bolters, or the Jump Captain with Fly. Captains are one of the best places to put relics and warlord traits, and there's a massive array of different ways that you can build them, a lot of the best ones being very codex specific. The damage output within the regular codex space marines, the Teeth of Terror is very nice, otherwise the Thunder Hammer with its damage 3 isn't bad at all. Storm Shields, where you can take them, add a little bit of extra protection against low AP shots, and in general I wouldn't usually be bothering with fancy ranged choices, you're far better off upgrading the melee weapons compared with its ranged fire. For Warlord traits within Codex Space Marines, Rites of War or the Imperium Sword might be two of my favourite picks, though with a table in every single supplement, there's often going to be better choices out there. Finally, if you've got a good unit or two to buff, then the Chapter Master upgrade can certainly be worth the points. Getting full rerolls to hit really does amp up the damage output of one unit each turn, and quite nice that you could flex it between ranged units or melee ones, depending on what was most important that turn. I certainly don't think that the Chapter Master upgrade is a mandatory one, but in the right list, I think can definitely be worth it. In general, captains are going to be very happy leading the most dangerous core units around, whether that's blade guard or vanguard vets, maybe things like eradicators or a castle of dreadnoughts, hand out the reroll ones and any other buffs from warlord traits and relics, and then get stuck into the fight themselves. Lieutenants aren't really all that far away from captains, a little bit cheaper, less wounds and attacks, and reroll ones to wound instead. Both the primaris and the firstborn ones have their uses, the Primaris one with the Storm Shield and the Neo Volkite Pistol being quite a good one. Maybe one of the easiest ones to go to if you stock for a build. He is only 90 points though, not 105 points as I've written here. Otherwise, for war gear, they're often very similar to the Captains. The Armor Indomitus may be having a bit more of a place on Lieutenants who don't have an Invul save naturally, so could have a bit more play. Otherwise, they do seem really quite similar. The Lieutenants may be a bit better if you want a bit more focus on buffing, and a smaller amount less focus on actual melee power. Next up we have the Librarians, often just using one of them if you're going to field them, as the first one will take your favourite spells, and then ones after that generally have slightly diminishing returns. Usually I think the Jump Librarian will be my first choice out of them, even if it is a bit pricey. All the others do have their uses though. Weapons wise, for the ones that have the choices of different power weapons, I'd be more tempted by the Force Axe and Sword over the Stave, and out of the generic powers out of Codex Space Marines, my favourite ones are perhaps Psychic Fortress, Null Zone, Might of Heroes, and Veil of Time. Perhaps the best of those might be Psychic Fortress to support something like a Redemptor Dreadnought Castle, though in general a lot of the chapter specific disciplines beat out these, say like Iron Hands buffing their vehicles, or Dark Angels in Terramancy. I'd say Chief Librarian is an okay upgrade, though I personally prefer to leave off myself, I don't think it's really amazing value. And again, as they're one of the HQ choices that lacks an invul save, something like the Armour Indomitors can be quite a powerful tool to stop them getting killed too easily. How you use them is going to be completely dependent on what sort of spells they're packing. 
Ideally, for most buffing ones though, you're going to want to stay out of deny range when you can, provide those powerful buffs to your army, and then when the enemy gets closer, switch to smiting, take out a few enemy models, and maybe only commit to the fight when it's absolutely vital, as librarians are kind of fragile. Chaplains next, and again I feel they're one of the models that has diminishing returns, often the first one's going to be taking the best litanies, and also the Master of Sanctity upgrade, so the second one is going to be far weaker than the first usually. Perhaps Black Templars are one of the only chapters that can really justify two very well. They do have their own tree of litanies to draw from. Despite costing quite a bit more, I still feel that the bike or the jump chaplains are still probably the best option, due to actually being able to get their litanies exactly where they need to be with the mobility. You do pay a bit of a premium for them though. In terms of equipment, relics wise the Benediction of Fury is a pretty reasonable option just for an all round dangerous melee chaplain. The Master of Sanctity upgrade to be able to do two litanies in a turn is almost mandatory. You're basically doubling the buffing power of your model for only a few points extra. Then when you've taken that, you'd usually want to take the Warlord trait for plus one to cast your litanies, so both of those good litanies go off very reliably five out of six times. As for the actual choice of litanies, I think it's one of the tables where Games Workshop has actually done really quite well to make all of them tempting. You could be getting both plus one to hit and plus one to wound on various shooting units. The melee buffs are generally good, plus two to charge is really nice for delivering deep strike units, and Mantra of Strength really puts him into rage mode if he does want to go on smash chaplain duties. Generally, chaplains are going to be happiest with big melee squads, things like Vanguard Vets and Terminators, getting four re-rolls to hit, and maybe other melee buffs too. So moving up the board alongside them, and then likely joining them in melee for the fight, both are quite nice. Finally we get to the Tech Marines, maybe one of the HQ choices where it is a bit more tempting to spam more than one, as both their plus one to hit and their healing buffs both affect one model. After the two, I think that the Primaris version gives you a fair amount more for the cost, in particular I quite like that Forge Bolter, which actually does add a little bit of quality firepower. Again, they can be a solid choice for Warlord traits and relics, particularly ones for buffing things like Dreadnoughts nearby, in particular the Death Watch gets on quite well with that. And for the Masters of the Chapter, the Master of the Forge is really quite a reasonably costed upgrade. Automatically healing three wounds every turn is really nice. Generally, they want to be following around really big vehicles, whether it's Redemptor Dreadnoughts or other big non-core ones like Leviathan Dreadnoughts or Repulsors. Plus one to hit every turn is quite nice, repair them a bunch of wounds, support with a bit of Forge Bolter Fire, and they can always lend a hand in combat when the enemy gets too close. So with the HQs done, I think that just about wraps us up for the entirety of Codex Space Marines and roughly how I'd filled them in game in most chapters. This one's taken a fairly ridiculous amount of work, so I hope you found at least some of that interesting or useful. Maybe if and when my sanity recovers, I might do this for a couple of other factions too. If you've enjoyed the video, feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics, but I'll certainly keep the regular 40k things coming, with new ones out just about every day. Finally, if you have been getting good value out of my videos, I'd just like to mention one way in which you can help support and keep them coming, and that's the channel's Patreon page down in the video description below. Making all this content each day does take an enormous amount of time and effort, and if you are enjoying regularly, any support is enormously appreciated. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some really big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, an enormous thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.